Hey guys, welcome back. So, um, in this video, and in the next one, and assuming I get the editing all done, I'm going to upload them both on the same day. Um, what I want to do is talk about, you know, as the title suggests, Manchuria and Japanese imperialism. But specifically, I want to talk about a style of Japanese imperialism, okay? Um, which was first termed by a historian of modern Japan named John Dower. And that is this thing called Go Fast Imperialism. Now, to really understand what that is and how it operates, we have to talk about the uh, Manchurian or the Mukdun incident. So, on September 18th, a group of people, the official story said it was um, Chinese troops, but more research, better evidence indicates probably that it was Japanese troops, although there still is a, a political controversy over this in East Asia. Anyway, on September 18th, 1931, a group of people take... Um, about 27 packages, okay, which are wrapped in yellow paper and which contain dynamite and, uh, blasting powder, and they place them on a section of the South Manchurian Railway in, obviously, Manchuria, where it's basically like Northeast China, okay? And at 10.20 p.m., those packages and the explosives contained within are detonated. So, the aim here, basically, was to destroy a chunk of the South Manchurian Railway, okay, possibly blow up a train, um, there was a train going over it as the thing exploded, um, and maybe kill some people, and then use that as an excuse to conquer Manchuria. That doesn't actually happen. The powder blows up, the track is a little damaged, but the train going over it basically is okay, and it reaches its destination uh, more or less in one piece. But, nevertheless, uh, units of the Kwantung army still use this as a justification to say, Okay, it was the Chinese. We're under attack. Um, so we have to take the fight to them. And they're in Manchuria. So we're going to use it as a false flag to go invade the region. And um, in the words of Ishiwara Kanji, one of the key members of the Kwantung army bring the warmth of the rising sun to the frozen wastes of Northeast Asia. That quote gets translated differently every now and again, um, but that's like the gist of it. The point is, you're going to use this as a justification to go conquer a portion of China and bring it into the Japanese colonial empire. Now, what this does to Japanese politics, okay, and I've outlined the main um, ideas or key points in the red boxes here, is it leads to a rise of um, coups and other illegal or semi-illegal military actions within Japan itself. Now, as that's going on, we have this thing called um, government by assassination, which is exactly what you think it is. People are taking out politicians all the time. Um, the Manchurian incident and the successful invasion of Manchuria by the Kwantung army leads to a series of um, political appointments and what are called compromise politics in the Japanese government, as well as um, this mass surge of Japanese um, grassroots kind of domestic support, okay, for what the Kwantung army was doing. And together, these two things, government by assassination and the rise of uh, popular support for the Kwantung army's actions in Manchuria on the mainland, okay, it leads to a paradigm shift. It leads to a drastic change in not only Japanese imperial policy, okay, how they actually um, administer their territories, but how they go about acquiring them as well, and it's called go-fast imperialism. So the idea is that you have um, Japan, you have your island nations, and then you have your buffer zone. So Korea, eventually Manchukuo, well, those two areas constitute key imperial cores, key imperial centers. Well, you have to keep those key imperial centers um, especially Manchukuo, safe from the Soviet Union, safe from Chinese nationalism, safe from Mao and the Chinese communists, etc. So you need to establish, um, you know, more buffer states and more buffer states and more buffer states. So it leads to the rise of these incidents, as the Japanese term them. Basically, it's um, semi-legal, semi-illegal actions on the part of the military on the mainland to keep launching these incidents in these military attacks on the Chinese to keep pushing the borders of the empire deeper and deeper into China. 
Let's go fast imperialism. It's done not necessarily at the behest of the government, but once it happens, okay, the government has no choice but to back the actions of the military, because things in Japan were relatively unstable until the rise of militarism sees army officers and others really come into the civilian government. So, after September 18th, 1931, once the Kwantung army launches the Manchurian incident and they start invading the region, um, and you can see on the map in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, this is the rough approximation of the different invasion routes that uh, the Kwantung army takes, and you can see it basically follows uh, the railway lines, which I've outlined in gray, okay, coming from Korea and going deep into what eventually becomes Manchukuo, all right, after this happens, there is a political power struggle in Japan, not only between the Japanese cabinet, um, but between the military as well. Now, as far as the Japanese cabinet is concerned, when this is going on, okay, it splits into two main factions, and basically those factions already know, well, this is happening, um, well, we can support it, we can push for military expansion, or we can disavow this, we can say, no, this is illegal, and we can tell the League of Nations and everybody else in the world, look, we have no uh, part of this, this is the action of independent or semi-independent army officers, and they will be court-martialed, they will be tried and thrown in jail, because this is technically illegal, okay? And we're going to push for de-escalation. We're going to apologize to the Chinese and we're going to try to rectify the situation. So that's basically how the Japanese government kind of splits over this. Now, what happened and what's important for the rise of Japanese militarism and for this policy of go-fast imperialism, okay, is that this split, it allows political enemies to basically form power blocks. So between 1915, 1920, so like those five years, going up until 1930, okay, the so-called China problem, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and the Manchurian problem, the Manchurian incident, okay, it turns into this opportunity for these different political power blocks, like the Kotaha faction, um, the Toseha faction, and others, including these, you know, semi-illegal um, secret societies like the Dark Ocean Society, the Cherry Blossom Society, uh, the Sakurakai, which we'll be talking about more in the next video, uh, the League of Blood, etc. It allows these different political extremist groups to form power blocks and basically take out political opposition regardless of who they are, regardless of where they stand in the government. So you start seeing, like I mentioned a minute ago, government by assassination. Basically a politician or an army officer, although usually uh, politicians more so than army officers, they're doing something that extremists don't feel is in the interest of Japan, so they take them out. There's one particular Japanese politician who's trying to implement some policy, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head, and an army officer barges into the office with a sword drawn, right, with a uh, Shingunto, a Imperial Japanese officer's sword, and he cuts the guy down, he kills him. And this happens over and over and over again. So basically then, what becomes at stake isn't just uh, these problems on the mainland, it's Japanese governmental stability. So essentially, okay, what's at stake here is not just uh, the issues on the mainland, not just, okay, how do we deal with China in the aftermath of the revolution and the ongoing civil war, and how do we deal with Manchuria and the Soviet problem, etc. It's not just that. It's the entirety of Japanese politics. How do you keep the government stable, and how do you steer the country on what you perceive to be the correct path um, in terms of what you should do as far as foreign policy on the mainland is concerned, how do you deal with the economic problems which come during the uh, Showa financial crisis in 1927, which is like a precursor to the Great Depression, how do you deal with the Great Depression, how do you deal with the League of Nations, etc. All of this gets wrapped up with the Manchurian incident, and it becomes an excuse to kill the political opposition. Okay, so with that said, um, one of the ways you can look at Japanese history is, and I've talked about this in other videos, but one of the ways you can look at this, okay, is as a pendulum. So you have the Japanese islands, and then you have the mainland. Well, this pendulum swings back and forth between, do we keep Japan isolated, or do we allow influences in from the mainland? And this goes back and forth over the course of Japanese history. Another way you can look at the course of Japanese history is as a struggle between um, the 
court, so the imperial family, and the Kuge. So the Kuge are these, uh, what we would basically understand to be Japanese aristocrats. They're not military. Um, these are the people that kind of hang around the court. They're the big landowners, and they concern themselves with politics and also with um, artistic pursuits, learning. They're basically like scholar aristocrats. So that's one faction. And then the other faction is the Buke. So the Buke are the uh, warrior military families. These are or were cadet branches of the Kuge or of the Imperial Court who were sent out to the frontiers to basically go defend it. And their um, loyal dependents, the retainers, the samurai. And pre-modern Japanese history can really be looked at as a battle between the aristocracy and the warriors, between these two factions. And... Modern Japanese history also can be looked at that in the same way. So instead of the court and the kuge, okay, you have the politicians and the civilians. Um, democratic government versus the military. So not only the army, but also the navy. And you have officers and soldiers in that power block as well. So during the Meiji and the Taisho periods, but definitely, definitely during the Meiji period, um, which runs 1868 to 1912, the military is basically in charge. Now, during the Taisho period, we get the rise of what's called the Taisho democracy, this outpouring and this increase um, of liberalism in Japan, the rise of democratic government. And it takes power from the military and transitions it towards um, political parties and towards the Japanese population. The late 20s, though, so 1926, 27, 28, that period, going into the 1930s, it sees the reversal of this, and it sees the return to power of the military in a way that um, would not really be out of place in the Meiji period. So, how do they do this? Well, the military doesn't seize power through coups, okay? Uh, they do this through playing, you know, a, a game of uh, political compromise. I wash your back, you wash mine, that kind of thing. But eventually it gets out of hand, and the political parties essentially just go by the wayside. And as Japan enters the Second World War, most of the political parties are no longer uh, relevant to any meaningful degree. So, if you want a deep dive on this particular topic, I can point you in no better direction um, than this book by a scholar named Louise Young, and I've mentioned it before on the channel. It's Japan's Total Empire, Manchuria and the Making of Wartime Imperialism. Um, so, Young is somebody I'm drawing on a lot for this particular video, especially this particular chunk of the book, which I've got outlined on the left-hand side of the screen, but I've got the main points from basically the whole thing outlined in purple. Okay, so um, the opening up of Japan in the 1850s once Commodore Perry shows up and he basically tells the Japanese, look, you know, trade with the West or there's going to be problems. Once that happens, okay, the Tokugawa shogunate doesn't really know what to do, so they call the daimyo, the uh, lords of Japan, and ask for advice. This severely weakens their authority. So, some daimyo say, well, maybe the shogun's not all he's cracked up to be. So they start forming opposition plots uh, based around the imperial family. So, once that happens, you start seeing this trend in Japanese politics between the 1850s and the 1930s, roughly, um, where opposition parties and opposition movements, they rally around this inadequate, poor handling of issues whatever those issues are, by the current government in power. And this is used by the military in the 1920s and the 1930s, okay, to basically take over the Japanese government, not through force, not through any kind of a coup. Um, that's not how this happens. They use these opposition rallies to basically garner support and say, look, this government's illegitimate. They're not doing the correct thing. They're steering Japan on the wrong path. We can get it back on track, but you have to support us. So people say, yeah, that makes sense. So they support the military, and the military basically seizes control um, through conscious political debate, not through any kind of armed uprising. Not to say that armed uprisings don't happen. They do, but they're usually crushed. So what that means then is that government by assassination, this idea that... Um, you know, some army officers, some people are dissatisfied with what's happening and they don't want to do the mainstream military thing, which is political compromise. They would rather kill politicians. It leads to fear among the Japanese um, general population and among the Japanese government officials. And it takes foreign policy 
and it shoves it to the forefront of Japanese debate in Japanese politics, and the military then uses that fear to leverage their way into power. Okay, so I've got this map of China up on the screen here. Now, it's in French, but the language is not really important. What is important, okay, is that the map shows the rough divisions of power among warlords and others in China approximately in 1920. So, as you can see, you know, China's not unified. The first Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, so in the 1890s and the 1900s, um, respectively, it launches a debate in Japanese politics over, well, what exactly are we going to do with the mainland? Japan is the rising power in East Asia. Russia has been defeated. We have some holdings on the mainland, like Korea. And all the European powers are breaking up China into their own spheres of influence. So how are we going to handle this? So from the 1890s, this becomes a major part of Japanese politics. Now, in 1911, you have the Xinhai Revolution, and basically what this is is an uprising by the Chinese, it overthrows the Manchu Qing Dynasty, and China is, at least in theory, turned into a republic led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. That doesn't last too long, and the revolution quickly breaks out into civil war as China breaks up and they come under the control of uh, warlords. Now, what this does is it freaks out the Japanese. It sends them into a political and a commercial panic. And you have the rise of the Taisho democracy, this period of liberalism in Japan after the First World War. And this panic, combined with the rise of parliamentarianism, means that the Japanese politicians now have to take into account not only what's going on with the military, but they have to take into account popular rallies, riots, these political parties, etc., in the Chinese question. Now, why are they so concerned about China? And the answer, basically, is this. So this is just one example, although there are many, many examples, but this is a uh, rough approximation of the total amount of spindles, as you can you know, clearly read on the graph, owned by the Chinese, the Japanese, and then Western powers. So basically, this is looking at the uh, textile industry and the growth of the textile industry in China. It's maybe a little easier to see when I have it plotted out like this, but what I want you to look at, okay, is the gray line. So this is the Japanese-owned textiles and the Japanese-owned spindles in China. And you can see after 1915, Japanese investment shoots up drastically. Um, it nearly doubles by 1930. So... The outbreak of the Chinese Civil War and the preceding Chinese Revolution, it means that there is potentially a problem with Japanese investment. Their investments could go belly up if China is not brought under control. So this is just one example of why the Japanese are interested in what's going on in the mainland. So this foreign policy debate over, um, you know, what, what do you do on the mainland? How do you protect the Japanese interests? In the early Meiji period, between about 1868 and... I guess 1880, maybe 1885 would be a better date. Um, the key foreign policy question is over, well, what do you do with Korea? Now, one faction of the Japanese government, led by um, Saigo Takamori and others, they favor basically launching a false flag operation, um, or maybe not even a false flag operation, maybe just outright declaring war, but they favor outright um, immediate conquest of the peninsula, because the argument is, look, if we don't take over Korea, um, the Russians are probably going to do that. And like the German military advisors we have training on military have made clear to us, Korea is like a dagger pointed at the heart of Japan. If we do not control that peninsula, our national security is going to be compromised. So that's one faction. Now, the other faction favors um, a more diplomatic approach, more gradual, you know, um, investment in infrastructure, in factories, in rebuilding the Korean military with Japanese advisors, sending Japanese advisors uh, to the Korean government, really bringing it into the Japanese sphere of influence. And then eventually you annex Korea, and eventually you integrate Korea. Well, after the Xinhai Revolution in 1911, okay, the Chinese Revolution and the subsequent um, civil war it takes this debate, which was happening over Korea, and it reignites it, and it shifts it to 
the question of China. Now, Japanese imperial policy then breaks into two competing ideas, which kind of are taken from the Korean question, but in a way they're a bit different, because there's more Japanese investment going on. And that debate, okay, is over go fast imperialism or go slow imperialism. So go slow imperialism is exactly what you think it is. It's exactly what it sounds like. You move slowly, you move incrementally, you use diplomacy to try to negotiate the chaos that is Chinese politics with all these different warlords. You try to maybe bring the country back together. Maybe you uh, have some non-aggression pacts or some other kind of diplomatic agreements with China, which allows you to trade with them. It allows you to set up more investment. It allows you to send military advisors, etc. And you do this while working alongside with the other people interested in similar um, foreign policy approaches to China, by which I mean the Western powers, specifically the Americans and the British, because they also have economic interests in the region. They don't want to see China completely broken up, um, or maybe they do, but they definitely want to see it under some kind of Western influence. Now, this is countered, okay, by what's called go-fast imperialism, which I brought up at the beginning of the video. The idea is that you have um, some kind of an imperial core, Japan, and then Korea, and then eventually Manchuria. Well, those imperial cores have to be protected, so you need more and more buffer states. So you launch false flag operations, you send in covert teams, um, and you launch border conflicts, you launch border wars to keep expanding the control of Japanese territory more and more and more, deeper and deeper into China. So what this then leads to is a major split uh, between Japan's two main political parties, and those two main political parties are the uh, Minsaito and the Sayokai. So both of these parties, they develop their own foreign policy based along the lines of either go slow or go fast imperialism. And each of these parties has a key diplomat. So the uh, Minsaito party has this guy, Shidehara Kijuro. So Shidehara, who gives his name to what's called Shidehara diplomacy, his whole thing is, look, everything going on is the result of Western imperialism. It's the result of colonialism and all this intervention. So what we need to do, okay, is look, we have these holdings in Korea. Okay, yeah, now apparently we have Manchuria. Um, but we need to not expand any further, at least not through military aggression. We need to scale things back. We need to use diplomacy to try to stabilize China and try to rebuild the economy. And eventually, okay, this is going to bring China on the side of the Japanese. It's going to bring them over into our sphere of influence, so we'll have a good ally when we fight, potentially, the Soviet Union, or the British, or the Americans. We have friends now, and he's looking at what the Seyukai political party is doing, and he's like, you're way too aggressive, and basically your actions are pissing off Western powers, and if you don't stop doing this, you're going to compromise national security, and it's going to drag us into a war with potentially America, potentially Britain, maybe France. But something is definitely going to come out of this, and that's not good. Now, on the Seyukai side of things, the key diplomat is this guy named uh, Tanaka Gichi. So, Tanaka Diplomacy looks at what the Minsaito party is doing, and they say, well, you're being way too weak. Okay, yeah, maybe we need some diplomacy. Maybe we need uh, some kind of economic development in China. Sure. Now, how do you get that? It's not through subtle diplomacy. What you need to use is an iron fist rather than the velvet glove. So you're going to send in the military and you're going to do these false flag operations or in some cases just declare war outright, seize more territory to punish the Chinese um, for everything that's going on. You're going to take the key industrial centers and try to maybe not vassalize China, but definitely set it up as a, an inferior partner in the Japanese sphere of influence in China. By using the military, by using force, you're going to not only stabilize the situation, but you're going to protect Japan's military, political, and economic interests on the mainland. And just like the uh, Minsaito party blames the Seyukai for pissing off the West, and this is compromising national security, you know, through all this aggressiveness, the Seyukai party blames the Minsaito because you are compromising national security because you don't want this aggressive action, so you're slashing the military budget, and that's not good either. We're surrounded by enemies, we need a strong navy and a strong army. So as the Manchurian incident is um, unfolding in September of 1931, the political party in charge is the Minsaito party, this party that favors, um, 
a more diplomatic approach to everything. They favor a more gradualist approach to getting things done. And the Prime Minister is this guy named Wakatsuki Rajira. So, the Kwantung army doesn't really buy into this whole weak diplomacy thing. They favor direct conflict, and they favor go-fast imperialism. So, as they're launching the Manchurian incident, and they're invading Manchuria, and they're trying to detach from China and bring it into the Japanese sphere of influence, either in terms of direct annexation in, or, or maybe in terms of uh, setting up a puppet state. They're not really sure at this point. It's in direct conflict with um, Shidehara diplomacy and the objectives of the Minsaito party. So on September 24th, six days after the Manchurian incident is um, launched and after it comes to the attention of the Japanese public, okay, the Minsaito government issues this um, declaration, the non-expansion policy. So basically, they're disavowing what's going on. They're saying, look, this is illegal. Um, our government has nothing to do with this. This is the action of rogue or maybe semi-rogue elements of the military. And they're telling the League of Nations and basically everybody else in the world, look, we're going to get a handle on this and we're going to bring the military under our control and court-martial these people. Now, almost immediately, once the Minsaito launched this uh, new policy of disavowing the Manchurian incident, governmental opponents, not only in the uh, Seyukai party, but in the Kwantung army and other branches of the military and other political parties as well, they seize on this and they say, look, what they're doing, this is not patriotic. They're not supporting the troops. They're not supporting the soldiers who are dying on the mainland for the good of Japan. And... They start forming this opposition movement. And this gets so heated that the emperor, Hirohito, eventually comes to Wakatsuki Rajiro and he's questioning him. He's like, what's going on? And Wakatsuki Rajiro tells him, and he says, oh, well, you clearly don't have a handle on this. Well, don't you think we should resign? And Wakatsuki Rajiro doesn't really know what to do because now the emperor is telling him basically, look, I disapprove of how you're handling this. Get out. So it leads to the collapse of the Wakatsuki government. And then you get the next cabinet um, coming in. But this is also a little um, suspicious, right? Because in October and in November of 1931, you have the prefectural elections in Japan. So many people were like, okay, the Manchurian incident is launched um, on September 18th, 1931. Well, the elections are the next two months. So... It seems like a really useful way to rally support over expansionist politics and getting expansionist politicians into government. So on the 30th of September, 1931, the Kempeitai, um, the Imperial Japanese Military Police, somebody files a report on the societal impact of the Manchurian incident and how it's affecting Japanese politics, okay? Now on page 39 of this um, police report, it's talking about a rise of conspiracy theories among people. And it's trying to connect, you know, this um, conspiracy theory is trying to connect what's going on in Manchuria to the Japanese elections. Clearly, this is a ploy by the Seiyukai and others to uh, destabilize Japanese domestic politics. And the way this thing operates is as follows. So, according to this conspiracy theory, the Kwantung army in Manchuria formed some kind of a shadow alliance um, with the Seirukai party. There's no evidence of this, quote-unquote, but, you know, of course it's there. As conspiracy theories always assert, it's always there, you just can't see it. Um, and the idea is, well, this alliance is going to see the Kwantung army launching the Manchurian incident to piss off the Chinese, to piss off the West, and ignite Sino-Japanese hostilities, to which the Monsanto party doesn't really have an adequate response. So... The people that believe this tend to support the Minsaito party, and they say, well, look, this is going to lead to the rise of political extremism in Japan and lead to the Seirukai party taking power. Now, as that rivalry is going on between these two political parties, we also have rivalry going on between two branches of government, the foreign ministry and uh, the army ministry, okay? So, the way the Japanese empire in um, East Asia on the mainland was basically set up was... In 1906, you get governmental offices for Japanese holdings on the mainland. It's not necessarily clear who has authority where. Where, where does the military have power in Korea and in the Kwantung Lee's territory 
and everywhere else, and where does the civilian government have power? How is that power division, how is it broken up? It's not certain. It wasn't really um, streamlined too much. So what you see on the mainland, okay, is eventually, not right away, but eventually, um, these compromises are set up between the foreign ministry, between the army, between the garrisons, etc. And these overlap in four areas. Montetsu, which is the South Manchurian Railway, the place where the explosion happened, which launched the Manchurian incident to begin with, the Kwantung Army Garrison, colonial consulates, um, not only in Korea, but in Manchuria, in the Kwantung Lease territories, which we'll talk about more in the next video. So it's not really certain who has control where. Now in 1919, this little green area on the map here, this is the Kwantung Lease territory that the Japanese initially have, okay? The foreign ministry in 1919 gets control over this, more or less, uh, because there are major territorial reorganizations in the Japanese colonial empire. And the foreign ministry is given pride of place in diplomatic negotiations between the Kwantung territory and the Chinese government. Now, due to the state of Chinese politics, not only over the revolution and the civil war, um, but over concerns for Japanese um, economic development, over concerns for Japanese colonialism in Korea, etc. Basically, in order to do anything, you have to negotiate with the Chinese government and with the warlords. Well, when the foreign ministry is given pride of place for diplomatic negotiations, that means they have all the power. And the Kwantung Army garrison doesn't know what to do. So they become reorganized into the Kwantung Army. And because the Kwantung Army is now diplomatically isolated, okay, they're trying to figure out how to get greater and greater autonomy on the mainland. And this leads to the Manchurian incident, the staging of this false flag operation to seize the initiative break the power of the foreign ministry, give power back to the army ministry, and create a new quasi-independent state, a quasi-independent territory on the mainland, where the Kwantung army is going to have greater jurisdiction, what eventually becomes um, Manchukuo. Now, in the construction of this new state, of this brave new empire, as uh, Louise Young terms it in her book, Japan's Total Empire, okay, Compromised politics is going to continue to play a role, and that is where we're going to turn to next in the following video. So guys, that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. I will see you all next time.